This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being, being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. Forgiveness is a radical way of living that openly contradicts the most common beliefs of this troubled world. It is radical because it involves a transformation of our thinking from thoughts of an eye for an eye to compassion and understanding. Forgiveness is the science of the heart, a discipline of discovering all the ways of being that will extend your love to the world and discarding all the ways that do not. Forgiveness is the accomplishment of mastery over a wound. It is a process through which an injured person first fights off, then embraces, then conquers a situation that has nearly destroyed him or her. Forgiveness restores our hearts to the innocence that we once knew, an innocence that allows us the freedom to love. It is the means for taking what is broken and making it whole. Valeria Tellez interviews Dr. Eileen Boris, the author of Finding Forgiveness, a seven-step program for letting go of anger and bitterness. Dr. Eileen Boris is a clinical and political psychologist specializing in international conflict resolution, multi-track diplomacy, and peace building. Since the 1980s, Dr. Boris has worked internationally to help rebuild more than 15 of the world's most volatile and war-torn countries, including for USAID, UNIFEM, and for UNDP. Most recently, as part of USAID and Thunderbird for Good program, Dr. Boris went to Kabul to train Afghan women to have a political voice and help change their societal norms. Dr. Boris has spoken to the United Nations General Assembly on forgiveness and the healing of nations and to members of the UN, UN agencies, and non-governmental organizations worldwide. She has shared the podium with such prominent people as Mary Robinson, former president of Ireland at the Aspen Institute and facilitated an interfaith dialogue with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and other prominent religious figures. On invitation by Marianne Williamson, Dr. Boris spoke at the Sister Giant Conference on Can Political Forgiveness Be the Answer? She is currently writing another book on political forgiveness, Healing the Heart of Humanity. Meet Dr. Eileen at DrEileenBoris.com and DrBoris.com. Here's the interview with Dr. Eileen Boris. In your own words, who is Eileen Boris? Someone who cares about, obviously, forgiveness, that this is my life's purpose. Who, who am I? I'm somebody who, at the end of the day, if I have been able to help someone let go of fear, that is a good day for me. So I, I'm someone who really does care about humanity and learning and helping people learn how to be kinder, more compassionate, more forgiving, so we can all live how did you come to this way of being, Eileen, of, of understanding of yourself and life? And what inspired you to write about forgiveness? I remember as a young girl, I grew up in a, a German Jewish family. And, and I remember hearing the stories of the Holocaust. And I remember even as a young girl thinking this could never happen again ever. And, you know, then life goes on and you become a teenager, then you go and develop your own career. And I think somewhere on my own conscience, that's what led me to becoming a political psychologist, 
and somebody who really wanted to make sure genocide didn't happen again. So that, that was part of what inspired me. And the other thing that inspired me was that I'm very, very interested not only in psychology, but in the different spiritual disciplines. And I wanted to be able to make those spiritual disciplines more available to people who might not otherwise think of themselves as being spiritual. And so I decided to actually write a book on forgiveness, but to write it in terms that people could relate to on a psychological level. You don't have to be a psychologist to enjoy the book because of the stories, but you don't have to be religious or spiritual either to understand the power of forgiveness in that Forgiveness is a commitment, and anybody can make that choice. Would you say it's a, a practice too, Eileen? Not just an understanding in time and a commitment in time, but also practice for life? It absolutely is. Forgiveness can become an attitude. It can become a way of life. It becomes a way of seeing the world through a different lens. So instead of seeing the world through anger or hatred or guilt or fear. We make a choice to see the world through understanding and compassion. And we choose to live our lives through that kind of lens. I love that, <laughs> of course. Mm -hmm. um, and with that in mind, I had to say the word love. Do you describe compassion in the same way you would describe love or the idea of love? I think they are two different things. I think compassion, I think there's some similarities in the respect that it takes a while to really learn how to be compassionate. We have to, to really work on it. It doesn't happen overnight. And, and the same thing for forgiveness. It's, it's really about a mind shift, a, a shift in mindset. And we have to always work on it. I mean, there are some people that have I, what I would call a miracle, and all of a sudden they see things differently because of what they've just experienced. But for most people, it doesn't happen that way. And so compassion is about being able to feel somebody else's suffering. Forgiveness at a most profound level is to be able to really understand that the person I'm really looking at has a spiritual essence. And that makes everybody worthy of being loved. Do you consider yourself to be a Buddhist? I know the information in the book, it's informed by Buddhism. I'm wondering if you consider yourself a Buddhist. I, I do. And one of the things that I love about Buddhism is that it's really a philosophy of life. And it provides a wonderful roadmap of how to conduct yourself and a set of values, which I'm, I know is in other religious traditions. But part of the work of Buddhism is developing that inner relationship with yourself. And that's why meditation in Buddhism is just so important. And that's another question that I often, I think I asked you before here, I'm sure I did, about forgiving, being able to forgive others. Is that something that in order to do that, it's important to forgive ourselves first? Uh, well, I always tell people who I'm working with in terms of forgiveness issues, that the hardest person to forgive is yourself. And if you can forgive yourself, then it does become easier to forgive others because we're reflections of one another. And um, we're very hard on ourselves. We, we have to learn how to be more gentle with ourselves and, and recognize that, you know, we're part of what I call the human condition which means we're running around with egos and we've got lessons that we need to learn. And that's true for everybody. And that we're, we're here, I, I think the real reason we're here is to learn how to love unconditionally and to forgive. And I, I'd like to share a little story. This reminds me of my work with hospice patients. I remember 
reading a book by Dr. John Lerma, and he he was working in the hospice unit over at um, in Houston, at the hospital in Houston, and he would have the opportunity to hear stories of people who are hovering between life and death. And it didn't matter if you were a nine-year-old boy, a Nazi, a very religious older woman. It didn't matter what walk of life you were. The stories came out to be the same message. And the message was that if you want to live a good life, it doesn't matter what you do. It's how much love you allow in your life, and it's how much love you give to others. And that the real reason that we are here is to learn to love and to learn to forgive. And if we can have that in our lives, we have lived a life well lived. And that was their message, every single one of them. What are some of the obstacles to love, to becoming this loving and gentle, kind human being? We have to heal our guilt in order to love. And we, we all come in with an awful lot of guilt. You can call it the Jewish guilt. You can call it the Catholic guilt. You can call it whatever you want. But we, and we don't want to be in touch with it. You know, who wants to feel that awful feeling in the pit of our stomach? It's, it's much easier to feel anger than to feel guilt. But the problem is we've got it. And instead of us feeling it, this is what the psychological dynamic of projection is. We don't want to look at things within ourselves, but we need to find a target. And so we place it on someone else. So I'm not the problem. You're the problem. And when you think about what's going on in, in the world, especially today, with all the polarization and dehumanization, what's at the root of it is our feelings of guilt that we put on other people. And so what gets in our way to love is to be afraid to look at that guilt. And the truth of the matter is, if we, we can take that first step and recognize that once we take responsibility for our lives and ourselves and our thinking and our emotional reactions, that's the step to healing guilt. Because mm. you can't feel guilt and be responsible at the same time. Mm. So, so true. Uh, which has a lot to do with doing the healing work, right, right. Eileen? Uh, being right. open enough to engage in healing. Yeah, I see that even around me and maybe even perhaps with myself too, because healing is this journey, isn't it? It's this process, ongoing process. It seems like it's always unfolding into new it things. Is. It's kind of interesting. But because I'm open to it, so it's kind of easier to kind of see what's there and, and hold space for it, even if it's dark and painful. I'm still present. And, and, and we are such complex people and I always share with my clients when we go on this healing journey there might be some things that you find out about yourself that you wish weren't there but there are other things there are other gifts you get on mm -hmm. a healing journey mm -hmm. which makes your life much more meaningful mm -hmm. and yeah. we we do know that when you allow yourselves to be vulnerable that's what brings you closer to yourself and to humanity and to the people you love and people around you. So true. I love this, um, the concept, the idea of being vulnerable, which has to do with being open again, right, Eileen? It mm -hmm. seems to me, come like they are together, being curious, being open to life. So there's no fear of being who we are, exactly where we are. Right, right. And, and it's also the fear that gets in our way of being able to love. And in a forgiveness process, some of the things that we look at, and it's another thing I tell people all the time, we can't skip any steps. That forgiveness is a process. It is a choice that we make. And as part of that process, we have to heal our anger. We have to heal our fear. And we have to heal our guilt. And when we're able to do that, at that point in time, then we can begin to step into somebody else's shoes. 
and understand what has gone on in their lives that have brought them to the place that we currently find them in. And we can recognize at that point, if we lived under those same kinds of circumstances, we probably wouldn't be very much different than that other person. This is a the broad, open view perspective that it's really a challenge to have all the time, mm-hmm. that everyone's going through something that we are not able to see, right? We don't yet understand. Right. We never know what somebody's going through when we, we encounter someone. And that's something important to keep in mind. And, and you know... You know, for example, you're driving and somebody cuts you off. So many people want to start, you know, with road rage when you don't know what was really going on in that person to begin with that made them drive in a way that irritated you. Would you say that everyone behaves the way they do for a reason? They have, Absolutely. right? They do. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I wonder about psychopaths. Because they're born that way, Maya, Aline. That's the reason why they act the way they do, obviously. So it's really a challenge to judge, isn't it? To judge it, others. It, yeah. it really is. And when, and when you're talking about, like, psychopaths, you're talking about personality disorders, which is truly a mental illness. And so we need to be really thankful when we're not that way. You know, I I I am thankful every day that... I'm able to help people with mental illness because to have a mental illness is horrific. We don't know, for those of us that are fortunate enough not to be dealing with things like depression or um, a behavior problem or even something as common as ADD, we don't know the, the suffering that goes on for other people who don't have the same resources or don't have the same uh, brain functioning that we have. And and so we have to be be thankful. You know, people say to me, how can you forgive, for example, someone who's murdered your child? Something like that is clearly horrific. And it's the hardest thing to overcome when you've lost a child. But think of the twisted mind that other human being must have had to do such a horrific thing too. And when you can begin to understand that kind of thing, that mental illness, being a prisoner in your own mind, that might be at least enough to disarm your anger to enable you to forgive. So in a way, the reason why we don't easily forgive and even forget these things because we are very much dwelling within the individuality, right? Like the the sense of me being hurt by. So it's always like life is doing something to me. So there's this, it's almost like a victim. I have been there, so I know what that feels like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's, you know, part of what I call the ego thought system. It, we, we all play the victim at times in our lives. You know, we need to have someone to blame something on. So it's poor me. Look at me. I'm the good person here. You're the one to blame. But what people don't understand is when you take on the victim stance, and you may know people in your life who always seem to be playing the role of victim, you really disempower yourself. And so what's important is to be able to step back and, again, take responsibility because that is empowering. And when we're empowered, we can begin to make different choices. And as we become more empowered and are willing to recognize that what I see in you is also in me, and if I lived your life, I wouldn't be so much different, we begin to recognize the interconnectedness of our humanness and of our humanity. And if we can take that step, then perhaps we can take the next step of saying within each of us, There's a spiritual core, a spiritual center. And part of the forgiveness work is to to borrow the phrase of Jerry Jampolsky, see the light instead of the lampshade. The lampshade is all our ego stuff, but 
the light is the truth of who we are, which is our spiritual essence. And in the forgiveness work, what we're trying to do is to recognize that the behaviors of someone is different than the essence of that person. It goes back to that spiritual perspective, Mayalin. It seems to clear everything pretty fast, too, has been my experience. Yeah. Uh, I see a lot more clearly that way. And it's, it doesn't really take away the uh, frustration when somebody behaves in a way that's not just, that's just unfair and hurtful. It's still, we feel, right? Because we are human beings. We are here to feel anyway. But it's just amazing to go back to that place, to the, the space of knowing that everything is interconnected and the essence is just pure. It's beautiful. It's not the same as the behavior, as you said. So true. How do you define mental health? What is to be mentally healthy from your perspective? To really know inner peace. When we can, we can really feel that inner peace within ourselves. And because when we come from a place of inner peace, that's what we give to the world. And, you know, we've all heard that that phrase, you know, if you want peace in the world, have peace in, within yourself. I really think that not too many people really, really have experienced that gift of inner peace. If you're a meditator, you probably have and you probably then know what I'm talking about. But if you can imagine going through this world, especially this these days when there's so much anger and hatred and fear, and to be able to sit quietly and feel that silence within yourself and feel that peace within yourself and walk that walk, mm. that to me is real mental health. Mm. Uh, yes, <laughs> I have to smile to that. <laughs> You want to bathe in it. Uh, right. It's so wonderful. <laughs> so true. I love the way you, you describe that too. Um, it's, we can visualize. It's beautiful. Also, there's a question that you raised in your book that it says, I don't have the, the, where it was here, but the question was, what is the meaning of true justice? Uh-uh. So I'd love to ask you that. And also, how do we practice true justice? True justice. Uh, I I, I love the question because when we think of justice, in, at least in the Western society, we think about you've done something wrong, so you need to be punished. There's that kind of, uh, we think justice is um, like a dictatorship or something we have to be obedient to, and that uh, it just kind of reigns in this um, a sense of moral values. But true justice is really based on honesty, love, and forgiveness. Uh, And we begin to, uh, when we understand that we can no longer see the perpetrator of injustice as evil or sinful, and it was just like what I was explaining a, a minute ago, when we recognize that within someone there is a spiritual essence that's when we begin to understand true to, true justice. When we can come, when we feel the love coming from within the depths of our being and we want to help with the healing of another human being and have compassion and a sense of forgiveness, that is true justice. And the practice, right? Seems like it's a beautiful practice to engage in too, of course. And, and we, we see some of this now in terms of what's being called restorative justice, where justice, you need to be held accountable for your actions. We all are responsible. The difference between restorative justice and retributive justice is the eyes in which we see what has happened. With true justice, we see that the acts of violence are really calls for help. And that makes a distinction. And so when you're able to recognize that what has happened is really a call for help, it could be a wounded soul, it could be a mentally ill person, whatever it is, you still hold them accountable. You you still may lock them up in prison, 
but the motivation is different. The motivation is understanding why this happened the way it did and what can be done to help in the healing of this individual. Mm. It's not just punishing yet. That's right. Right. And, uh. and as I was mentioning with restorative justice, that's what they, they do. There's a lot of times in the restorative justice world where the victims and perpetrators come together. And again, it's not about not holding someone accountable. And I want to make that really clear. If somebody has done something wrong, they need to be held accountable. It's the consciousness in which you deal with that human being. And instead of, you know, uh, locking them up and throwing away the key, you say, well, yes, they have to be locked up and away from society. But what can we do to help them and help the victim? How can we restore the victim as well? What do they need? It's about restoration, Mm. not retribution. Oh, I love that. Yeah. Which is revenge. Isn't it close to the same thing as revenge? Yes, it is. It's a... State-sanctioned revenge is how I look at it sometimes. Yeah. What comes to mind is the death penalty, because that, that still happens here, right, Eileen? We have that in some states, uh, I believe. So what is your view on that? Well, I, I don't believe in the death penalty. And we, we've done a lot of studies in psychology which have made it clear that the death penalty does not stop crime. And here again, it's really important to understand that to me, that's state-sanctioned violence. The need for revenge, it doesn't help anyone. It's all about restoring. It's all about healing. Ah, yes, a billion times again (laughs) to (laughs) healing. (laughs) Ah, yes, yes, and yes. So you wrote the book, Finding Forgiveness, a seven-step program for letting go of anger and bitterness. Talk to me for a moment. Uh, We have been talking already about a lot of the topics in the book, but an open question is, what was the main intention and purpose of writing your book? Did you set an intention initially? Yes. As I studied more and more about forgiveness. And and I, I want to also mention that I'm a student of something called A Course in Miracles, which for me is a very sophisticated, uh, it, it lays out a very sophisticated thought system of what happens within our ego thought system. And I wanted to bring down those principles in a way that people could understand. And It became clear again that our most profound healing is through our work of forgiveness and that if I lined up 10 people right now from on the street and asked them what does forgiveness mean, we would get 10 very different answers. (laughs) And so I wanted to write the book to help really explain what is forgiveness, how we can learn to forgive. And that anyone is capable of forgiving and for forgiveness. And so in the book, as you know, there are many, many different stories of people from all walks of life, from somebody who could be your next door neighbor to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. And everyone has their struggles. Forgiveness doesn't come easy. And I'd much rather have someone say to me, I cannot forgive so-and-so. I'm really stuck. Then for someone to say, oh, yeah, I've just forgiven them and not have done the work in their own healing. Because forgiveness, it's not about letting someone off the hook. It's about letting go of our own personal emotional burdens. And I will start talking in a very pragmatic way about what is forgiveness. We, we want to let go of our own anger. We don't want to be bitter people. And I will explain it that way. And as you get deeper in the process and begin to experience other things, I will go deeper with you because what forgiveness truly is, not only is it a profound healing, it ultimately, if we work on it long enough, teaches us about grace and teaches us about our own divinity. And it gets to be very profound. 